Okay, so what I wanted to do today was to give a little bit of motivation about how we can think about using large scale structure surveys, CMB surveys, in ways that are, go beyond um, the sort of I guess the standard and conventional ways we have been thinking about using those data, um, and in particular in the context of looking at dark energy and uh, testing gravity on cosmic scales. And I'm going to try and uh, give you a taste of uh, three recent papers that have come out in December and January this year um, that, that help motivate that. And uh, these have been led by, uh, not by me, uh, but by graduate students, postdocs and undergraduate students um, uh, working at Cornell. Um, and so I will uh, give them uh, due credit as we go through each of those three. It's down to their work um, that these um, interesting uh, papers have come out. Uh, I'm gonna first start talking about some work on the kinetic uh, sunyev zeldovich effect, which, uh, uh, I know many of you, including Colin, know all too well, but give you uh, those of you who don't work in that area, uh, give you an idea of, of why we're very interested in using that technique. Um, then I'm going to talk about how we can use, um, we, we might use spectroscopic surveys not to look at clustering regions, uh, but to look at uh, void regions and use those as uh, interesting environments for testing gravity. And then finally, I'm going to um, talk about some recent uh, work we uh, have done looking at how you can combine different traces together um, to try and uh, try to offset uh, and, and, and have an interesting interplay between different scales, different traces and different redshifts um, to try and test put constraints on gravity. Okay, so the whole motivation of this is to really understand the origins of cosmic acceleration. And of course, this has been uh, an effort for now uh, over two decades, um, trying to understand where the modifications to Einstein's equations need to come in order to um, explain cosmic acceleration. It could be a cosmological constant, but uh, we still have not understood why that value, the observed value is 120 orders of magnitude smaller than those predicted by uh, theory. Uh, it could be an, a different type of matter that evolves in redshift um, that does not is not something that we are able to observe here terrestrially, or it could be that we just don't understand gravity in the cosmological scales and density and the environments that we observe these cosmological observations in. And so large scale structure surveys, both within the last couple of decades, but now I'd say, you know, really moving to the, uh, a, a much larger scale in the coming decades. So with Rubin LSST, with DESI, with Euclid, with Roman, and with upcoming CMB experiments like the Simons Observatory that, um, uh, that the Flatiron is heavily involved with in CMBS4, will be a provi provide powerful unprecedented data to test which aspects of this uh, theory space are, uh, 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 hold true. And it comes through, you know, sampling a variety of spatial scales, uh, different cosmological environments and redshift scales. And each of these observations that we'll be talking about provide different facets um, to uh, understand this, this conundrum uh, and also in combination. So my, my elephant at the top is, you know, coming from the, the parable of how, how do blind men understand an elephant? You all have to look at different aspects of it um, to get a full picture. So of course we understand gravity extremely well within the solar system, uh, but as you know, as the gravitational wave astronomy uh, 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 push has, has also made, we need to understand the properties of gravity, not just in our solar system environment, but also in other uh, parts of that parameter space. So here is a, a, a really nice plot I like from Demetrius Saltus a good few years ago now, which shows that if we really want to understand gravity, we don't, we can't just localize it into thinking about the gravitational potentials and the, and the curvatures that are uh, experienced within the solar system. We really need to push it to all the regimes. So we think we can think about the compact object regimes um, probed by LIGO. We can think about the galactic centers provided by the Event Horizon Telescope. 
But cosmology also allows us a different window onto the properties of gravity that these high density, high curvature um, regimes don't give us an insight into. And so it really is a complementary observational window that we shouldn't presume we know how it's going to behave in those environments by looking at other very different uh, situations. So in terms of the work that's gone on to date in looking at dark energy, we can really think about three classes of uh, observables. The first are looking at the homogeneous expansion um, and looking at geometric measures to understand the expansion rate. So things like the angular diameter distance inferred from the CMB last scattering, supernovae luminosity distances, baryon acoustic oscillation, characteristic scales imprinted in galaxy clustering and strong lensing time delays. But then we can also use large scale structure to not look at the homogeneous, but look at the inhomogeneous um, effects or the, the effect of gravity and dark energy on inhomogeneities. There are two real ways we can do that. One is to look at measurements of the growth rate of history through bias traces that allow us to get a sense of how the gravitational potential has evolved up to some normalization, namely how those traces are biased relative to the underlying dark matter field. And that includes looking at the distributions um, the number counts, the velocities of galaxies and galaxy clusters. But then we can also get direct measurements of the uh, gravitational potential through the integrated sachs wolf effect in the CMB on large scales, CMB lensing and galaxy and galaxy cluster lensing, which in theory give us a direct measurement of the gravitational potentials, although arguably integrated along the line of sight. So what I wanted to, what, part of the, uh, the message in this presentation today is that an individual survey, an individual probe doesn't give you the full picture. And what we want to do over the coming decade is leverage trade-offs and complementarity across the many LSS, the large scale structure and CMB surveys. We wanna be able to contrast the ability to get photometric speed and imaging with the spectroscopic redshift precision, spectroscopic surveys. We wanna trade off the survey area um, of, of Euclid with the depth that we're going to see with the Roman W first uh, um, survey. We wanna see um, repeated overlaps of, uh, uh, of, of different surveys surveying the same region. Um, and we wanna see the effect to be able to remove the effects of like dithering and cadence on from an individual survey and over, like, overlap what we can see of the underlying cosmological maps by, com by comparing different observations. We wanna contrast the precision that we get from space with the larger uh, sampling that we can see the survey areas from the ground. We want to use multiple astrophysical traces, different mass levels, different environments, different redshifts, and we want to um, combine all of those to get the fullest picture we can. And in combination, therefore, the idea is that these individual surveys can actually give us a richer set of observables to be able to understand not only cosmology, but of course, extract out the astrophysics and go beyond any individual survey's potential. Okay, so with that motivation, then I'll start just talking about the first paper that, uh, and it's actually a pair of papers we brought out recently um, in, as part of the ACT collaboration. And I'm gonna talk about one paper in particular, which is a measurement of the pairwise kinematic sonyev zeldova effect um, using the ACT data with uh, Sloan uh, spectroscopic galaxies. And this is work that was led by Victoria Califort, who is a graduate student at Cornell, who's now at CETA, Patrizio Gallardo, who uh, was a postdoc at Cornell and is, is heading off to Chicago, Eve Vavidiakis, who's a, a graduate student at Cornell working with Mike Niemack, and Stefania Anamadeo, who's a postdoc uh, working with Nick Battaglia. So say Patrizio is a uh, pato, is working with Mike Niemack too. And so um, this work came out in, in January. So it's focused on uh, a, a, an observable called the kinematic sonyev zeldovich effect. And this, uh, for those of you who are not involved in this field, is essentially a, a measurement of the Doppler shift of clusters, of galaxy clusters, 
um, seen through an imprint of uh, that Doppler shift on the CMB relative to its rest rate. So if you have a CMB photon, it interacts and scatters with those energetic electrons within the intracluster medium. And if that cluster has a peculiar velocity along the line of sight towards us relative to the CMBS frame, it, it, it induces this blue shifting or a, a Doppler shift. And so that is encoded in a essentially a ten temperature decrement or excess, depending on the peculiar velocity, imprinted in the CMB. So this is one of a number of Sonia Zeldovich effects coming from, uh, uh, from clusters. Um, the other most famous one is the thermal Sonia Zeldovich effect, um, which comes from the heating of the CMB relative to the um, as by the by the hot intracluster gas. Um, and uh, on the right here is a plot just showing the frequency dependence of the thermal SZ decrement or increment change relative to the kinematic one. And you can see that because the, the thermal SZ is essentially a shifting in the black body spectrum as you heat up the CMB photons, you end up with an excess in the high frequencies and at the zero point is about 220 gigahertz and a decrement at lower frequencies. And so surveys like ACT that have multi-frequency bands are able to use those multi-frequency bands to extract out the thermal SC signature and get thermal SC detected clusters, for example, through that technique. In comparison, the kinematic SC is uh, a much smaller effect. It's about a factor of 10 smaller, but it also has a really weak frequency dependence, which therefore presents challenges in how you extract it. So the way that we uh, look to extract it is to utilize the fact that these, um, the KSC is coming from motions of clusters and those motions of clusters are correlated with each other. Essentially, we expect clusters to be infalling relative to their gravitational potential, to be gravitationally attracted with each other. And so we expect there to be correlations in those peculiar velocities between the clusters. So if we look at the pairwise correlations, the pairwise infall of those clusters relative to each other, that should be something that allows us to extract out this effect. And we identify the clusters typically by identifying optical uh, members of the cluster um, as proxies. So we use optical surveys to identify luminous red, typically red galaxies in those clusters to, um, <coughs> to uh, identify and locate both in spatially and redshift space where those clusters are. Once we have identified those clusters, we would then, uh, or the cluster locations, we then use aperture photometry to extract out the temperature um, of that temperature of that cluster. And so this just gives you a little stepwise example of how we do that. We use that galaxy proxy to center the cluster, to determine a center of the cluster. And we typically, what we do is take the most luminous galaxy as the most massive galaxy, and we assume um, that that is in the center of the gravitational potential of the cluster. There are astrophysical <laughs> realities that that is not perfect and we can get miscentering errors, but let's take that aside at the moment. We then around that center will calculate an aperture photometry by considering the average temperature within an aperture and then differentiating it from uh, the from an annulus around that aperture to be able to subtract off the background CMB. We then take into account the fact that we want to get, um, we, want to we want to subtract off our sort of th thermal SZ contributions. Now we shouldn't, we don't expect that the thermal SZ will have the same characteristic correlations, right? So when we look at that correlation, all of these, these contributions to the, to the cluster temperature should be suppressed in that, in that signal. But we might anticipate that if there's evolution in the TSZ because of redshift, then we might, if there's a little bit of an increase, then we might expect that that perhaps could mimic it. So what we do is we smooth over um, the temperature within those apertures across a particular redshift and weight it by the redshift differences and subtract that off in order to get a temperature decrement. We then use those temperature decrements to calculate this pairwise KSC um, using geometric factors to account for the radial co-moving separation between the clusters. <laughs> 
Okay, so before I start talking about how that observate how those observations have come about with a number of surveys, I just wanted to say that the, the intent here is to connect those observations to underlying theory, to cosmological theory, and we do that by making predictions of what we expect that pairwise decrement to be um, for a particular cosmological model. So on the right here you can see this p hat theory. This is saying that the pairwise, um, pairwise momentum is going to be related to the pairwise velocities of the clusters multiplied by the optical depth of those clusters with a ratio of the temperature in the CMB and the speed of light. And so the idea is that if we have observations with, an, with knowledge of the optical depth of the cluster, we might be able to backtrack out then an estimate of the peculiar velocity and use that to constrain cosmology. And that expression there, that V is that pairwise velocity and it has a number of dependencies that are in, have cosmological information, including the linear growth rate, F, the Hubble rate, uh, they're giving redshift, and then clustering information from the halo correlation function. And one of the key parts of this is that, of course, these clusters are a biased tracer of the underlying dark matter. And so we need to be able to model the bias functions um, and understand what the mass sample is for those clusters. So that's another piece of, of theory that has to go in there and nuisance parameters. Okay. So in thinking about where we want to head with this and the potential, the cosmological potential, a few years ago, um, uh, Eva Marie Muller, who was a graduate student with me and is now a, a postdoc at Oxford, Francesco de Bernardis and Mike Niemack, we did some work sort of forecasting what the potential could be for this approach using stage three and stage four surveys. And what we found was this was actually a very nice complementary way to test, for example, the growth rate um, and also constrain neutrino masses to, um, for example, uh, other techniques using redshift space distortions of galaxy clustering. And so there is potential here if we can understand, for example, the understand the mass, mass um, the effects of the bias, the, the model of the biasing and get measurements of the optical depth to be able to get out some very nice uh, underlying physics, dark sector physics here. So we've seen a number of pairwise kinematic results in recent years. Um, we've seen them from Planck uh, across, uh, uh, for example, the Sloan samples. We saw for, uh, uh, earlier ACT results from Hand et al. with Boss and with from Francesco uh, and Francesco de Bernardis et al. Um, with another earlier Sloan sample, and we've also seen it with. Um, uh, with photometric surveys from SPT, so that Polar Telescope CMB across the Dark Energy Survey. Um, so there's been very nice uh, sort of track record of, of utilizing different increasing galaxy samples and also photometric and spectroscopic samples to extract out these effects. So our work this January was taking this um, to, the, uh, to the, the next step, um, utilizing uh, sort of five years of ACT data um, and using the, the, the most recent releases of uh, the Sloan uh, Luminous Red Galaxy spectroscopic samples to uh, take 300 and odd thousand, 340,000 galaxy LRG proxies um, and those, the redshift distributions are, sh are shown here um, out to around redshift 0.8 but averaged around redshift of 0.5 to get this pairwise KSC effect. And what we did was look at various luminosity cuts of these clusters estimated by connecting the luminosity of the proxy galaxy to the luminosity of the cluster. Um, so we tried to look at them in different mass spins to see the effect um, uh, on the signal. Oh, I should say actually, so in addition to, to um, single frequency results, so at 90 and 150 gigahertz with ACT, what we also did was use a multi-frequency um, map that combined um, Planck and ACT data um, in an internal linear combination map as well um, to compare different, so the effect of taking single frequencies and looking at the effect of um, foregrounds on that and then looking at an internal linear combination map. 
So here is just a, a, some of the results that we found. And you can see this, uh, this is showing essentially this, this um, correlation where you're seeing a peak in full, um, a correlation between the uh, clusters at around sort of 30 to 40 uh, megaparsecs. Um, and uh, a distinctive signal, multi-signal multi signal that as you go to higher uh, separations, you know, you do, you, you tend towards no mutual correlation of, of infall. And this is for three different luminosity builds. So there, the top one is for the full sample uh, that we considered. So it has the smallest error bars and then we take a higher luminosity cut and a higher luminosity cut again, cumulatively. So they, they all have the same uh, upper bound. Um, so as we go to the lower plots there, the noise gets bigger because the sample gets smaller. But what you can see here is for those, the, the comparison results for the same galaxy sample, but the three separate maps. And what you can see is very nice consistency in the predictions for the, the, the three separate maps. One thing I wanted to touch on um, that uh, Patrizio Gallardo was uh, led, was looking at uh, how we estimate the errors, the uncertainties in these signals. Often these are the, the, the way in which you, so there's three ways we could, we could do this. One is to create noise simulations of the survey and look at the covariance across those different simulations. Another is to sample from the data itself which in theory then <clears throat> means you've included all the possible uncertainties. You don't have to be restricted by how well you modeled it in the simulation. Frequently that's using jackknife um, sampling where you remove a, a fraction of the sample and recalculate the signal and calculate the covariance once you remove the signals, the sam subsamples multiple times. An alternative is bootstrap resampling where you essentially re randomly reassign temperatures with replacement and, and so we did jackknife analyses first, but what then we realized was that it was, um, it was underestimating uh, the uncertainties. And so this on the right hand side here is showing the distribution of chi squares using a jackknife resampling, which is the blue curves, uh, the bootstrap resampling, which is the orange curves, and then looking at the distribution from noise simulations that we had. And you can see that the bootstrap resampling gives a much better unbiased measure for these pairwise velocity. And it may, um, and, and Pato conjectured that, it, and um, I think it makes sense that, you know, when you're removing one from a pair, we really, we, but we're calculating a pairwise statistic, this is somehow altering the distribution we need to. And so the re, uh, making sure there's a replacement uh, remove that potential bias. But I thought this was really, it was a really interesting and neat piece of work that makes you think carefully about how you're estimating the errors um, for, for statistics that aren't just a simple uh, count over individuals. So then we <coughs> looked at um, putting constraints, comparing this with theory. And what we did was just use the Planck best fit cosmology compare the observations to the theory to get an estimate of the optical depth, the average optical depths of the samples. So the plot here in the middle is showing you the data compared and, and overlaid on that is the, uh, the best, the, the sort of best fit from the theory with the tau uncertainties and on the bottom are the, uh, the likelihoods of the optical depth measurements. And again, I think the nice thing here is showing the consistency of the optical depth estimates from the three different maps for a given galaxy sample and the, the way in which you can see the optical depth is increasing as you go to the higher luminosity samples so as we would intuitively expect. But we're not at the level yet of being able to know the optical depth and then push it to cosmological constraints. And one of the challenges we found was when we looked at the optical depth estimates from that comparison of the KSC measurements to theory, and we compared them with the optical depth estimates from the thermal SC analysis that Eva Rajakis led in the, in the partner paper, we found that these KSC estimates significantly lower than the TSC. And so there's a lot more work to be done to really understand how we can use these KSC measurements in the push towards cosmology in particular, is this because the distributions of the signals with uh, the KSC and TSC emission are, are just morphologically different? 
is it that we need to understand the halo biasing, the halo mass estimation, the cluster mass estimation, how that's related to the proxy galaxies in more accurately. Um, and so uh, uh, we're going to be doing the next, some of the next steps are running these pipelines on simulated clusters, for example, the WebSki sims and trying to see whether we, we see the same thing there or whether it's something in the data and then also trying to do some better understanding of how we get the cluster mass estimation. Uh, we can use uh, alternative ways to get masses, for example, with cluster lensing or with red mapper photometric uh, mass estimates. So there's uh, lots of interesting work coming out of this. And it's motivated by, uh, you know, the next generation of spectroscopic surveys and CMB surveys. So for DESI, Cross ACT and Simon's Observatory, DESI is taking its first data now. Um, we expect uh, <clears throat> the first year of DESI, so about if it's going to be about a 10% survey, to be comparable with the analysis that we've just done in terms of the number of uh, galaxies we expect to see. And so that's the perfect way for us to look at refining and honing that pipeline uh, and to understand how the astrophysical and analysis systematics might be coming into play. But for the full DESI, and especially if we then move to Simon's Observatory as well, we're looking at an order of magnitude more galaxies. And so we can, that if we are able to refine this approach, you know, it's the perfect transition to be able to do some of the things I talked about and um, move from astrophysical understanding of clusters towards constraints on cosmology. Okay, so I'm going to segue now to topic number two. Um, and this is work that's been led by a graduate student working with me, Chris Wilson, um, and it's looking at how to test for gravity um, in void environments. So not thinking about galaxy clusters switching to the exact opposite now. And I've, I've included the, um, both the link to the paper, but also a link to the GitHub repo where Chris has put all the codes and um, analysis for this. So just to give you an overview as we switch topics, um, voids are a really novel way that people have been starting to study uh, novel environments that can allow us to probe potential deviations from general relativity. And people have thought about this in the context of void number counts, um, using void lensing in voids, but also these velocity statistics. And so one of the things, so the thing that Chris has done is to look at how galaxies in voids um, uh, uh, their motions and how that's affected by um, deviations from general relativity. And, and the work that he's done that I'll, I'll describe now um, is theoretical in nature, motivated from the simulations, but it, the next step is to really think about how we might be able to use spectroscopic um, uh, galaxy surveys to, to make some of these, um, these signatures observable. So when we think about uh, galaxy dynamics, um, we're thinking about their motion within the gravitational potential phi. And in the case of having modified theories um, that deviate from general relativity, we introduce an effective fifth force. So this second term on the right hand side here uh, is what we're in F of R gravity you're looking at is the uh, gradient of this additional scalar mediation. And so um, we need to think about evolving both the Newtonian potentials that are due to the local density and this fifth force, which is an additional scalar mode that's evolving in the course of the density as well. And in those equations, in that first equation in that second bullet there, we've got an effective mass term um, that when uh, you have over dense regions, it makes that term sort of, it, it suppresses that fifth force term and, and it can, and it acts more towards uh, general relativity and you've got screening, but in under dense regions, the modification is allowed to be free and so you can, and unscreened, and so you can uh, hopefully see some of these effects more clearly. So what we did, uh, what Chris and I did in this work was to use some n-body simulations that were developed by Baoju Li and collaborators, 
um, end body realization. So we had GR ones and we considered two F of R models, uh, which I'll call F6, which is a, weekly, a weaker modification closer to GR and F5, which is more strongly modified. And in each of these simulations, they had the precise um, sort of nonlinear evolution of the F of R theory so that it encodes the, the full effects of these theories in the, um, in the dark matter evolutions. So we took these um, simulations um, with two snapshots. We just took redshift zero, redshift 0 0.5 um, as, as our sort of uh, uh, our straw men. And we used uh, a, a, a void, um, uh, void finder, which uses a watershed transform. Essentially you find, you, you raise up the density until you find these um, uh, sort of transition points and be able and define rather than using a spherical sort of blow up a balloon until you find the size of a void, it allows for uh, the void to have a more um, inhomogeneous shape. So we use this to identify voids. We did find that most of the voids, if you look at this, uh, ex, uh, the eccentricities, they are roughly uh, spherical, but we identified them in this way using this prescription. We then um, looked at classifying the voids, and this is uh, this will be important. Um, so there's we we looked at voids by size, and what we found was that the vast majority, about seventy five percent of the voids, are modest in size, so less than about twenty five megaparsecs, independent of the type of cosmology. And there was really two types of classifications we looked at, and we call and they're called R type and S type. Um, R type for rare and S type for shell, I think is, is, is fair to say. And so we found that um, you can characterize this based on this average sort of integrated density profile out to the effective radius. Um, and as we'll see, um, S, uh, rare types basically have a, are, are wholly um, in a void region, whereas the S types have a, a, a dense shell on the outside of the void, which means when you integrate out, the integrated density can be zero, even uh, greater than zero, even if it's void in the, re in, the, in the central region. And so what we found was 50% of the smaller voids and 75% of larger voids were in this R-type category, this rare type category that doesn't have the outer shell. Okay, so here's some examples on the left hand of some density profiles for the voids. And there's, there's, th there's I guess there's three types of lines here. Blue is for, um, is for the smallest voids. Orange is mid-side void, mid voids, so 25 to 35 megaparsecs. And green is the larger voids that we considered out the average of 50 megaparsecs. And there's two, there, the, there's two theories shown here, the GR model, which is the, thin, the, the full line, and then the dot dash is the F5, the most strongly modified model. <clears throat> and what you can see here on the left-hand side are the R-type voids, which um, as you, they have a void on, and, in the central radius, and then they come out with a very mild, they're almost just zero density for the most part in the outer regions. Whereas on the right-hand side, you see the S-type voids that have a significant shell outside of the void region that can affect the dynamics. And this is showing you the voids for uh, the density profiles based on the halos and based on the dark matter particles below. And what you can see is in each case is very little difference in the density profiles from uh, uh, from, uh, between the two scenarios. So we're not necessarily using the density profiles as a distinguisher between the theories. However, if you then look at the velocity profile, the velocities of the galaxies, well, we here we're using dark matter halos as traces for the galaxies. Um, you find that for in particular for the smallest voids, so the left-hand sides here, the R-type voids, you do get differences in their velocity profiles. So this is actually for the particles. You can see the, particle, the dark matter particles in the simulation. And you can see that as you go from GR to F6 to F5, the velocities get greater. And that's because of the differences in the gravitational potentials because of that additional fifth force. If we then look at the same result for the halos, there's fewer halos and dark matter particles, so the errors go um, uh, are slightly larger, but we still see for those smallest voids, we see that, dis that distinctive pattern of an increase in the velocities 
um, of those halos within the voids. And so um, this is just showing you the ratio of the velocities, the peak velocities in the modified gravity models relative to GR at redshift zero and redshift 0.5. And what you can see is that in theory, if we are able to probe the velocities of these smallest voids, they might offer the best opportunity to be able to distinguish between these models. As you go out to larger voids, there is less effect. So um, one thing that we then did was try and understand this in terms of the theory, the F of R theories. We looked at both the linearized um, F of R models where you linearize the mass term in terms of an effective mass term mu um, and looked at it in terms of a dimensionless um, rate size or position variable R tilde. And then the second thing we did was to look at the full nonlinear equations um, to uh, allow for um, the effects of screening. Um, I won't belabor this too much, but um, one interesting thing you can do in looking at the linearized equations is just think about them as effective window, having effective window functions on those, um, on those fifth forces. And so if you look at the acceleration due to New Newton, the Newtonian acceleration, and look at the fifth force acceleration, you can write them in terms of a Fourier integral over the density profile with two different window functions. Um, and then think about where those window functions are, are peak. If you look at the peak density, essentially where those, those um, integrals are gonna be peaked, the spatial dependency of those window functions so that you can understand where the influence on these fifth forces is coming from. So here is a plot of that window function value in that the, we'll go into that fifth uh, force or acceleration equation. Um, on the right hand side is just the Newtonian one and what you find is that, that it has a very monotonic, very, it doesn't, it, it peaks at the center but then has a monotonic um, decrease as you go out. While the fifth force, um, does, the, the window function actually, the peak influence for F6, the weaker model, is on these very smallest voids, as which, which is what we saw, and then at more intermediate scales with F5, and that's consistent with what we saw in those velocity profiles, that the smallest voids um, are the ones that are the, have this effect most prevalent. And it doesn't seem to change with redshift, but it does, the, the scale does change with the strength of the fifth force. And then finally, we integrated, we did the integration analytic of the fifth forces. And indeed, as you look on the bottom level there, you can see the total fifth for, total of force for within the voids um, uh, as a variation of, so GR, F6 and F5. And what you can see is that it's again the smallest voids, those R type small voids, where we see the difference, uh, the, the fifth force really creating that difference in the forces, which then leads to that difference in the potential. So, what we're seeing in the simulations holds up with a sort of analytical interpretation of those fifth forces. Mm. Okay, so I'm conscious of the time, so I'm going to now mention. Um, the third project um, that we brought a paper out on recently, and this was led by Rain Liu, who is an undergraduate who is working with uh, Nick Battaglia. And uh, she's going on to graduate school in Chicago, I believe, um, now next year. And then Georgios Valagianis, who is a graduate student with me, who's just recently started a postdoc at Harvard. And this is looking at <coughs> constraints we might get on F of R gravity and NDG NDGP gravity by combining two different large scale structure traces or statistics. One is constraints on the growth of structure from cluster abundances, and the other is looking at uh, spectroscopic galaxy clustering. So this is the, idea. the idea here is, um, is combine the power that we can get from combining two complementary probes. So as I said, the first one, oh, it's got one and one here, my bullet numbering has failed, but anyway. Um, the first one is galaxy clustering from a DESI-like spectroscopic survey. And what we want to do here is include both linear and mildly, mildly non-linear regime clustering. We've also looked at using multiple moments here, statistics, so monopole, quadrupole, hexadecapole moments of the correlation function coming from that as a function of, of redshift. 
And we're employing techniques that Georgios um, uh, has led um, along with um, uh, um, uh, our collaborator Avales um, to be able to model um, semi-analytically how these clustering, these um, uh, correlation functions are modified in FFR and NDGP galaxies, not only for dark matter, but for looking at bias traces as well so that we can employ predictions for not just the dark matter, but for what we expect to see with luminous red galaxies and emission line galaxies for a survey. And then we're using expected number counts from DESI and from this paper by Font Ribera et al from a few years ago. We're pairing that with predictions of how of cluster abundances um, from, recent, from uh, some recent work by Matt Madahachuril and, uh, and Dylan Cromer and Nick um, and Mia Taki and, and again, um, Matt as well, um, to look at these from a CMBS4 like survey. This is now constrained wholly in the linear regime. And, we've and we're using this in the context of um, what those cluster abundances would translate into constraints on uh, sigma eight as a function of redshift. And we're using, um, so they're using uh, uh, predictions of uh, uh, lensing calibration from optical surveys below redshift of two, and then self calibration using CMB lensing out to redshift three. Okay, so I just wanted to <clears throat> give you a sense of what from the galaxy clustering perspective in terms of being able to accurately model what we expect to see for these correlation functions for different modified gravity theories. We've, we're building on some work where we looked at um, uh, n-body simulations um, of these modified gravity theories and developed a similar approach that um, allows us to predict what those clustering predictions are with good accuracy. And so this just shows you um, predictions from that previous work for a spectroscopic survey, looking at both monopole and on the left-hand side, the three curves, the blue, black, and red from top to bottom for those, sorry, color, not very colorblind friendly, um, are for different mass traces. So um, if we're thinking about, you know, different selection, galaxy selection functions, and then on the right-hand side, we have the quadrupole. And so we, we, we're happy about the ability to be able to make these predictions for the modified gravity theories down into um, the modeling nonlinear regime. On the sigma eight cluster abundance um, side, this is showing uh, you from the paper um, as a function of redshift, the, 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 um, the pale beige um, lines show you the estimated uncertainties from a CMBS4 like survey for this sigma eight, the deviation of sigma eight from lambda CDM. And then the colored curves are showing you the differences in those predictions for different theoretical models for F of R and the left and the middle and for NDGP on the right. And the left it's varying the magnitude, the strength of that F of R model. And on the, in the middle, it's just varying another parameter of power law um, uh, variation, um, uh, it, this N variable. And so what you can see here is that we expect the constraining power from these sigma eight models to be most tight from the redshift less than two. And we expect in the context of the F of R theories um, to have the variation in F of R to be more tightly constrained than the other parameter N. So this is, um, now I'm realizing flitting between galaxy clustering and sigma eight, but for the galaxy clustering um, from DESI, the survey alone, then what this on the right hand side here, we're just showing the Fisher analysis constraints for the more strongly modified model F5 on the top and F6, the weakly modified model on the bottom. And it's the constraints that would come from the uh, lower redshift luminous red galaxy sample and the larger and more new larger sample and larger redshift sample of emission line galaxies in blue and then the combination in teal um, and so what you can see is that principally for the for the stronger modifications which will hit at will whose effect will be more will be pronounced at a higher redshift we're seeing constraints coming wholly essentially wholly driven by the elgs but in the, if, it, if the modification is weaker and so it really starts to become more pronounced at lower redshifts, then the LRGs can also play um, a, a role as well. So what we did was we looked at how, you know, what, what are they going to be the constraints on these models if we combine both the galaxy clustering data 
and from uh, from the ZNB S4 survey, and uh, sorry, the galaxy clustering from the Desi Light survey and the cluster abundances from the CNB S4. And there's some really interesting, um, sort of, I think, messages here about the redshift and tracer dependencies and how they can nicely interplay. So if you look on the left here, this is for the strongly modified model. And you see that the galaxy clustering, the DESI data, really drives the constraints here. Um, that's because these effects are going to be able to be seen at the, at the higher redshifts and, and those and the ELG sample is able to really provide the most robust constraints. But there is some really nice complementarity as well in the bottom where you can see those two dimensional spaces in terms of providing um, nice constraints in that F of R N um, and result that where um, while they while f of r is constrained by the uh, by the galaxy clustering the uh, the cluster abundances are able to break those degeneracies and provide um, nice constraints on that n parameter mm. for f of six however which evolves uh, it will become more pronounced at lower redshift the galaxy clustering and the clustering abundances are playing very nice complementary um, uh, roles in in getting those constraints and then finally, just for this NDGP model, an alternative modified gravity model, this has, has less scale dependence than the F of R theory. It's a very scale independent model. And what we find here is that the um, galaxy, um, sorry, the, the cluster abundances are, are really um, are driving the constraints here. Okay. So um, that was my uh, sort of tour through three recent papers where I hope I've advocated that there's both interesting things to, uh, interesting statistics that require combining large scale structure and CMB data sets, but then there's also interesting things that we can do by looking at new environments um, revealed by uh, spectroscopic data for voids and also um, power to combining multiple traces and multiple data sets to reveal um, different uh, aspects of, of theories and, and may perhaps be able to help us constrain uh, those parameters. So um, just to tie it together, um, you know, there's a number of surveys. This decade is going to be uh, so exciting in terms of having new CMB, um, uh, new CMB surveys with Simon's observatory CMB S4 that are going to provide order of magnitude improvements in, in resolution um, and sensitivity and with large scale structure with LSST, Euclid, Roman, DESI building on our current, you know, DES, HSC, PFS surveys. And, but in order to fully leverage these um, to be able to test gravity, we need to couple that with precise modeling of what we need to get from observational predictions in dark, dark sector theories, which means we need to, you know, leverage accurate and efficient ways to combine analytic and simulation methods to understand what we might see and trying to understand how we can search for those distinctive signatures. So developing novel statistics, new statistics that are complementary to existing ones, um, combining data that we have to, to, to realize new observables like in the kinetic SC effect, trying to leverage multiple epochs, multiple traces and multiple environments from voids to galaxy clusters, and using that data to be able to extract out cosmological signatures from systematics that might mask or allow us to misinterpret them. But, you know, it really does offer us an unprecedented opportunity in the coming decade from both a theorist and an observational perspective to be able to understand gravity on cosmic scales. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Rachel. Uh, I'll clap, I guess everyone else is uh, virtually clapping. Yeah, that's okay. Yes, uh, thank, thanks a lot for this, uh, this uh, very interesting talk. Um, so we definitely have time for some questions. Um, if people can raise their hands, that would probably be best, or you can type into the uh, chat window. I guess as people think, uh, I can ask one question that came to mind. Um, I was wondering for the, the the last part, uh, the, the cluster abundance constraints, do you have to take into account the fact that, uh, so the, the cluster masses are calibrated with weak lensing measurements, presumably, but the theory of gravity changes, then the way that you do the mass inference through weak lensing, presumably, would also change in general. So is, yeah. is that something that you actually have to take into account? Yeah, that, that's a good question. It's not something that's been taken into account. Um, 
so yeah in theory you know in theory lensing is it, the the lensing should be um should remain the same for you know um but but the uh it's not it's not it's not certain that the lensing and the um and the tsc um like sort of profiles will remain the relationship between those two would be the same and that's something actually that um we're interested in looking at with uh, 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 got a proposal in with Arthur Kozowski, who's been thinking about this, thinking about how we simulate clusters in modified gravity and whether that affects the observables and how. But it's not incorporated in this analysis now. Okay. Um, let's see. Does anyone have a question for Rachel? I know it's so hard over Zoom. Yeah. Um, well, I might ask one more question, I guess. Uh, as a sort of outsider to the, the, the uh, modified gravity world, I was wondering, do you have like a particular favorite model that you're most excited about constraining in the next decade? I mean, I know F of R has been popular off and on. DGP seems like it was more popular maybe 10 years ago. Yeah. I was just wondering if there's a particular hypothesis that you're most excited about. Testing. I have to say, I feel like it's a bit like saying, what's your favorite fake cheese? Like, I, I you know, I don't, or squirty cheese. Like, I don't think any of them is palatable. And I don't think any of them has really risen to the level of being, you know, where, where it's a, uh, a cosmologically acceptable model uh, that is robust, you know, is robust. We're using them as toy models that allow us to play with, um, you know, simulate what their effects might be using them as phenomenological models largely. But I don't think we, I think, and, and, and I'm, I have to say, um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's saddening in a way that we haven't made more progress in the theoretical side of how we might describe these modifications um, if we want to test them ultimately, you know, a decade a decade from now, we may just be saying it's lambda CDM and GR. But in order to get there, we need to understand what the alternatives should look like in a theoretically robust way. At the moment, F of R and NDGP are practically simulatable and understandable theoretically, and give us modifications. But I don't think I don't think I would ever say that they any either is my favorite. Right. Fair enough. Let's see. David has his hand up. Oh, you're muted, David. Nice talk, Rachel. Uh, the um, given that we don't have, you know, a really good form of fake cheese, uh, I would note that Oliver Zahn, some of you may remember, as a cosmologist, is now working on developing fake uh, vegan dairy products. Oh, really? Um, yes, that's what Oliver's doing. He's a company. Um, it's kind of like uh, F of R models, um, <laughs> and you know. But the alternative is to, to looking at particular models is to write down things that we know lambda CDM can't do. And the one I think about is in this area is like structure growth, right? Because we know the growth rate of structure has a certain dependence in uh, lambda, C, you know, lambda CDM. And I, is there a similar thing you can write down with voids? Or you can say, if we see this, we know lambda CDM is failing. So I think one of the things that I and and I, I have to say this the um, the work that we're doing with Chris is I I think just like we've been thinking about statistics that um, combine peculiar velocities and lensing, right? So the EG statistics, where you're essentially cross-correlating two different observables and comparing the consistency of those in GR. I think that where, where this might go is to think about the growth rates that are coming from dense environments, from clusters and galaxy clustering, and make predictions for what you're going to see in void environments and find an inc and look for a statistic that combines those two and gets uh, and looks for an inconsistency. I think that's where we want to go. And that's where that's where this was, you know, the original thinking was going, but it's, this is doing it in the context of just looking at voids. Whereas I think what we want to do is to look at two environments together and, and try to pass them. 
Yeah, no, that 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 seems like a, neat, a nice way to go, right? Because one of the basic features of GR is gravity behaves the same way in voids and dense regions. Mm -hmm. And these FFR models is an example of one that violates that. Mm -hmm. that, that symmetry is a nice symmetry to mm -hmm. be, able, be able to test. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Oh, surely. Hi, Rachel. Very nice talk. Um, thanks for coming well, coming over to the talk today. And um, I was just curious um, if what we were actually having the group meeting earlier when we mentioned Tom's new method where they used the carry nearest neighbor and cross correlations mm -hmm. and how that's similar to the Mark correlation function or Mark power spectrum. And right. I thought those both of them will be very useful for a modified gravity type of stuff where the environments could be probed in these right. simple statistics and and i thought like those two yep talks today will be was very cool yeah no no and i have to say so i didn't mention it in this talk but george a few years ago george and i looked at the application of mark statistics but in dense environments not in void environments so in dense environments are trying to pick that out I have to say, though, in, in work we did as part of DESI uh, in the last, we had a paper out in November with a large number of authors where we looked at simulations. The problem for us in looking at those mark statistics is understanding um, halo occupation distribution functions. And so all of the all of the interesting things that you might see in dark matter just get as soon as you start to have to understand what those predictions are for the galaxies that you observe essentially all of that variation can just be subsumed into fit you know if you fit the two-point correlation function then the mark correlation functions essentially don't have that much freedom to deviate from it and so we actually while we could see interesting effects in the dark matter once you start trying to translate that into galaxies um, it becomes it becomes diluted out and what you need to do is to look at for example again um marked correlation functions in the lensing and contrasting that with numbers or something like that something where you're contrasting two things rather than using that statistic on its own but that's why i'm thinking maybe voids and clusters might be another way to get at that but yeah i know i have to i'd have to go and read tom's paper uh, <laughs> to understand but it's that's why it's nice to come and visit like you say you get to um and also um and, and also my talk today with will as well about about gravitational waves was also really stimulating thank you right on cue i see that will has his hand raised yeah um well, I should preface my question with saying that if, if Colin's an outsider to this field, I'm like a galactic scale immigrant or something. Um, a nearest neighbor. I, <laughs> <laughs> not nearest neighbor, uh, but <clears throat> kind of sparked by David's question. I'm wondering the, the logic behind going for two point correlations as estimators of things is then you don't have to get the amplitude of the like one point function right. You don't have to get DNDM right or DND void size right in order to get a good estimator. And of course it's very hard to get those amplitudes right from theory or you know simulation or whatever. But now I'm wondering since every over density just from mass conservation makes a void mm -hmm. if you could look at the relative amplitudes like the big over density amplitudes tell you something about the amplitudes of big voids Yes. So and I think then you can use yeah. one point functions directly because you can calibrate the amplitude of one species from the observations of the other one. I think that's true. Yes. People are looking at the effect of void on void abundances as a test of gravity. I was actually quite I was quite I had expected that the density profiles would be different in that similar in those simulations. And I was surprised that they were so similar. But it's certainly I believe, as you said, it's certainly true that you can apply a press sector style thing and you you will get the, the voids and the and the cluster increased clustering will increase increased voids. There's also um, people thinking about 
you know, going back to the idea with the CMB using um, uh, using morphologies and looking at you know connected spaces and using one point functions in in that way, um, you know, and and on, on and higher order statistics. And so, I think the one of the one of the things we're also trying to look at at the moment is the practicality of this. Obviously, by definition, in void reasons, you don't have many samples, um, galley samples. So um, when we start to look at DESI selection functions, are we actually going to see enough objects? What what are the what are the realities of how they traced it? And so. I think using lots of different statistics, like you say, and using the diff, you know, different number counts, spatial scales, um, dynamics and correlations, I think that we're gonna need all of them to try and eke out what it looks like. 